Welcome to the New America event uh, for the 2022 Bringing Americans Home uh, report by the James Foley Foundation. I'm Peter Bergen, uh, Vice President, New America. Uh, delighted to introduce Diane Foley, uh, President of the Foley Foundation, who will say a few words before we begin uh, this event. Thank you, Peter. I want to thank the New America Foundation for their generous support. And thank you, Peter and Amna, for being our moderators today and all our wonderful panelists. And thank you to each of you who've taken time to join us. Because while lots of progress has been um, made in terms of the return of our wrongful detainees and hostages, we have some real strong concerns that we found through our research this year that we want you all to be aware of. So please listen in, send your questions, and know how grateful we are to each and every one of you. Thanks a million. Thank you, Diane. So um, on our first panel, the hostage and wrongful detainee landscape, uh, we're going to be led off by Cindy Litcher, who is going to um, explain the findings of her report uh, that she authored for the Foley Foundation. And then we're going to get uh, some reaction from Chris Costa, the executive director of the International Spy Museum, former special assistant to the president, senior director of counterterrorism at the, at the National Security Council, among many other things that he's done in his career. Um, also, Brian Jenkins, who's uh, long followed the hostage issue uh, for and has uh, more or less invented the field of counterterrorism in the United States. Um, uh, senior advisor to the president of uh, RAND Corporation, and Ali Soufan, um, chairman and CEO of the Soufan Group, uh, former FBI agent, um, and somebody who's done also so much work uh, to keep America safe, so, and keep Americans safe. Uh, so Cindy, we'll start with you, and uh, you're going to do the presentation, and then we'll, we'll hear from the panelists and their reactions about your findings. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, hello, I'm Cynthia Lurcher, the Director of Research, Hostage Advocacy, and Legislative Affairs for the James Foley Foundation. Um, I would like to thank New America for hosting this year's report launch and uh, to the fantastic team over at Wise Blood for publishing this year's Bringing Americans Home Report, and to all of you viewers and moderators and our very, very talented panelists for joining us today. I'm deeply humbled to have the opportunity to write the Foley Foundation's fourth annual Bringing Americans Home Report. It's a great honor of mine to be able to reflect the successes and challenges many hostages and wrongful detainees and their families face. Um, this year, uh, interviewed 60 individuals associated uh, with a specific hostage or wrongful detention case, uh, the majority being family members, family representatives, advocates, and former hostages and wrongful detainees themselves. So overall, the structures created in the 2015 uh, Presidential Policy Directive 30, uh, what we call PPD 30, and Executive Order 13698 remain impactful, but many Americans are still not coming home. Uh, before PPD 30, we had an entirely classified hostage policy called NSPD 12. In addition to its classification level, the policy lacked critical components that we see in PPD 30 today, one being the creation of the hostage recovery fusion cell, uh, which is an interagency currently housed in the FBI. Uh, second, the hostage, or excuse me, the Office of the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs at the State Department and the Hostage Response Group over at the National Security Council. In addition, uh, another important component to PPD 30 was the creation of the Family Engagement Coordinator. These structures have greatly improved the quality of family engagement, information sharing, and consistency, and accuracy, and coordination of US government engagement with hostage and wrongful detainee families. However, not everyone has access to these government entities. Wrongful detainee families report more delays in gaining access to the special presidential envoys uh, excuse me, office, citing challenges in elevating their cases out of consular affairs. Um, overall, more and more Americans are still not coming home in a timely manner. The current number of Americans held hostage or wrongfully detained tracked by the Foley Foundation is currently 64, with an average length of captivity of four years. Over 90% of those cases are wrongful detention cases. Hostage families and not, not, not quite, uh, hostage families and wrongful detainee families are calling for more 
and faster decisions coming out of the White House, uh, more negotiation expertise within the administration. Uh, for the director of the hostage recovery fusion cell and the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs to be given more authority and have direct access to the president of the United States. In addition, wrongful detainee families are having a difficult time obtaining wrongful detention status, uh, which was co codified by the Robert Levinson Act back in December of 2020, um, as these potential wrongful detention cases continue to languish in consular affairs and for sometimes years. Overall, the wrongful detainee families uh, what experience working with the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs is a vast improvement uh, from working with consular affairs. Uh, so we'll go to the first slide. Uh, since, uh, since 2001, there have been at least 153 U.S. nationals wrongfully detained by state actors, with approximately seven U.S. nationals detained per year. Over the last decade, the number of U.S. nationals wrongfully detained has increased. From 2001 to 2011, 49 U.S. nationals were wrongfully detained, an average of four, approximately four U.S. nationals per year. Now, I just want to emphasize, these are incidents that we're talking about. So we're looking at that, um, uh, the lighter red line. Uh, so, okay, so from 2012, an average of 11 U.S. nationals were wrongfully detained each year, so it's increased. And that number represents a 175% increase in the number of incidents of US nationals wrongfully detained. Uh, now, looking at the darker shade of the red, uh, the number of US nationals who continue to be wrongfully held by foreign governments has increased 580, 580% over the last decade. So from 2001 to 11, an average of five US nationals were wrongfully held by foreign governments each year. And from 2012, an average of 34 U.S. nationals were wrongfully held by foreign governments. This number, again, represents a 580% increase. So since 2012, um, the number of releases each year has not kept pace with the number of detentions, resulting in a cumulative increase in the number of U.S. nationals who remain wrongfully held. And it's important to note, uh, nearly one third of U.S. nationals who have been wrongfully detained are still being held and that's of the full um, database there, a third of the database, and nearly half of those currently detained have been held for more than four years. Now we'll move to the second slide. Uh, next, uh, looking at the hostage taking by non-state actors. Uh, this section was also co-authored by Seth Lurcher. And so about according to the data, uh, there are indications that the number of Americans taken hostage has decreased but the trend may not be durable. The average number of US nationals taken hostage each year has decreased by approximately 40% from 2012 to 22 compared to 2001 to 11. Uh, while the decrease in the number of hostage taking is roughly one third is encouraging. Uh, it should be treated with caution for two reasons. First, travel has been restricted uh, due to COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic. And second, over the past several years, there's been a decrease in the territory controlled by terrorist organizations as Western-led counterterrorism efforts in the Middle East uh, and Africa pushed back boundaries of terrorist control group, or terrorist group controlled, uh, excuse me. Uh, in addition, hostage taking of US nationals appear to be becoming more difficult to resolve. Nearly half of the US nationals still held have been held for more than five years. While the number of US nationals taken hostage has decreased over, over the past 11 years, many of the cases are not being resolved. As a result, the total number of US nationals currently held each year has increased. And that's the dark red that we're looking at. And you can see the dark red, those are the, those are the Americans being held, where the gray are the incidents. Um, so the average duration of US national captivity when taken hostage has increased, increased excuse me, approximately 60% over the, the past 10 years. So we'll end that slide. And, uh, and so, but of note, uh, right after completing this year's report, there were two hostage releases, one being the most recent, Mark Freyrich's. The timing of this event could not be better because we can all celebrate Mark's return to freedom. The Foley Foundation applauds all those within the hostage enterprise. Mark's dedicated family and 
the family hostage advocate, Eric Lepson, who, who's on the Foley Foundation's advisory council, who worked tirelessly to bring Mark home. But what's interesting about Mark's case is that it resembles so many other ongoing hostage and wrongful detention cases that we see today. One question to ask is, did the US government use all opportunities to bring, uh, to bring and in this case, Mark home? Some would argue that Mark's return could have been a precondition of the peace accord signed a month after his kidnapping in February. This case has a great deal of relevance because it highlights the importance of making these cases a priority over other policy equities. It also highlights the critical role that families play and how they can be effective advocates for their loved ones. It also further highlights the importance of having a productive working relationship between advocacy groups and government entities like the Hostage Recovery Fusion Cell, Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs, and the Hostage Response Group. Today uh, is a day we can celebrate, but the findings also highlight that it is a day when we need to redouble our collective efforts to bring Americans home now. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, well, let's uh, get some reactions to that from our panel. Let's start with Chris Costa, the Executive Director of the International Spy Museum. Hey, Peter, thank you, as always, for moderating. And thank you, uh, Cindy and Diane and my esteemed uh, colleagues on the panel. Uh, it is a privilege to be able to talk about hostages today. So I had an opportunity to review some of the recommendations and also uh, to uh, reflect on uh, on these recommendations while I traveled overseas last week, uh, frankly. And the bottom line is, from my perspective, is these recommendations are not revolutionary, they're evolutionary, they are absolutely necessary, and they are grounded by a new paradigm of states wrongfully detaining Americans. In a, in a broader fashion, it seems to be a trend that is deeply troubling. So it is absolutely critical and necessary for PPD 30 to evolve. And uh, I, I think that the recommendations are inspired. I'd be happy to talk about specifics, but I have five other points I wanna make very briefly. First and foremost, and we'll probably hear from Brian on this, uh, but hostage, hostage taking remains profitable. It certainly remains profitable now by states taking hostages or wrongfully detainees. Regardless, the effect is the same, taking away people's individual freedoms for some kind of leverage. Hybridizing hostage taking as part of a state's statecraft is a malign form of insurance and that too is profitable for states like Russia, for states like China, for states like Venezuela. So that is significantly uh, part of that trajectory I'm talking about. And I guess the third point, and this goes back to the counterterrorism enterprise writ, writ large, and that is diplomats, statesmen, if we can come together the way we did historically to focus on counterterrorism, regarding hostages, not just hostages held by terrorists, but hostages that are wrongfully detained, I think we will be much better postured to handle these cases. And again, the recommendations that Cindy lays out in her report, in, in this report, is absolutely crucial for doing that. And I guess the last point is just to highlight again, I believe we are at an inflection point with regard to states uh, taking hostages, wrongful detainees. And I think that is a significant problem. And at the end of the day, it is gut-wrenching uh, to remind our audience that my predecessors and my successors alike, we always have unfinished hostage work. So we can never rest on our laurels and we collectively don't. So I very much appreciate this forum and this particular report. Thank you. Uh, Brian Jenkins. You need to come off mute, Brian. Brian, you're on mute. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, hmm. Before answering the question, just let me quickly add my thanks to Diane Foley and to the Foley Foundation for their 
uh, for their continuing efforts to bring Americans back. This is a noble service to uh, to those held captive abroad, to their families, and and to the nation. And those same thanks uh, certainly apply to uh, many of the people here on, on on the panel and and in the audience. Uh, and, Cynthia and I had a, had an opportunity to talk about her her report, and I and I had an opportunity to, to review it. I think it's I think it's excellent. Uh, I think the suggestions are reasonable. I agree uh, with Chris that that uh, this is an evolving problem, and therefore policies are going to evolve with it. Uh, on the government side, and I'm 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 not here representing the government, but on the government side, this is this is still a work in progress. Uh, we have come a long way. There's still a lot more to uh, to be done. Um, in in bringing in in bringing um, hostages home um, and, and looking at some of these figures, um, first of all, with regard to the the decline in in um, kidnappings by non-government groups, uh, that historically tends to follow its own trajectory. So I I I, I wouldn't try to infer too much of a cause and effect uh, uh, there. I mean, we saw waves of, of, of kidnappings in South America in the 70s. We, we saw uh, uh, another wave connected with the civil war in Lebanon in the 1980s. Uh, we, we saw a wave of them uh, again in Latin America, especially Colombia in, in the 90s and early 2000s. And, and we saw another wave uh, connected with the uh, with the intervention in Iraq, as I say, that tends to go up and down. Wherever there is a complete breakdown in law and order, we're going to see kidnappings, both ordinary ransom kidnappings and politically motivated kidnappings, um, in, in increase. Um, the the increase in um, uh, detentions, wrongful detentions by states, is a trend. I think more. Uh, we, it's not just uh, it's not just Iran, although there are a handful of serial uh, detainers who account for a disproportionate number of of cases, and Iran uh, certainly is at the top of that list. Um, but here I would I, I would probably add a cautionary note, uh, which really in in dealing with Iran, just to take one example. Uh, I, I think it underscores the complexity of, of, of these cases. I mean, if you look at U.S. relations with Iran, we have a long list of issues. Their ambition for nuclear weapons, their uh, terrorist plots against American officials uh, abroad and even here in the United States, uh, their sponsorship of, of militias and terrorist proxies uh, elsewhere in the Middle East, um, and and in in that sense, uh, bringing bringing individuals back um, is one other complexity, and this becomes kind of kind of a, a, a Rubik's cube of trying to get all of these pieces uh, in place. It's not going to work every time. Um, Similarly, as these uh, captivities increase, and we end up with a number of people um, who, who face very long captivities, then in fact, that cumulative total, and that's what that line is, is inevitably going to, be, uh, to go up. I, I think where the, the, the challenge for the US right now is really, as Chris, I, I would agree with Chris here, is number one, um, not only dealing with each case as it comes up, uh, but also attempting to uh, create a broader international strategy and enlisting allies in dealing with the phenomenon in general. Um, the Canadians have, have launched a diplomatic initiative uh, aimed at this specific issue. I, I think beneath uh, beneath international conventions, um, I, I think there is work that, that is going on to create really a network of affected countries by this who are quietly working together, increasingly so, uh, to bring Americans uh, to bring Americans back home. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Ali Sufan. 
Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you for hosting and thank you for the New America Foundation, uh, Diane Foley, for being uh, an amazing advocate for this and Cindy for putting this fantastic report. I know this is your fourth report and uh, the numbers uh, and the recommendations of the report speak for themselves. I don't want to you know, um, repeat some of the um, uh, uh, issues that uh, my colleagues, uh, Chris and uh, Brian, brilliantly outlined. Uh, I just wanted to go more from the strategic into the operational. Um, I think definitely PPD 30 and uh, the whole hostage enterprise need to be updated. This is something, um, you know, uh, sometimes some of the stuff in it cannot be relevant as it is. It's like any business. You start the business a couple of years, you figure out what you need to do, what's working, what's not working. And uh, definitely we need to uh, do the same with, uh, with the hostage ent enterprise in general. And Sydney actually um, mentioned that as uh, part of her recommendations. Um, also on the same time, we need to figure out a way um, how can we bring Americans home? I mean, if you talk to the folks in the fusion cell, and if you talk to Roger Kirsten and his office and the White House and State Department, everybody's heart in the right place. The problem is when you put all the interagency together around the same table, sometimes the bureaucracy take over, direct tape takes over. Things that need a month will need you know, a year and things that needs a week, it will take a month and so forth. So um, I think when we uh, have the opportunity, and I hope they listen to this recommendation from the report to update uh, the hostage enterprise, all these bureaucratic elements, uh, what's working, uh, we need to build upon, and what does not work, we also need to fix. Another thing is, and this is something Brian mentioned, the multilateral response. Um, you know, a lot of citizens are being, not only our citizens, but citizens also from Western countries like England and Canada and France, um, all are subject to um, this, um, this uh, phenomenon. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes when we're working to get our citizens back, we see ourselves compete against each other. Uh, some countries don't have the same rules and regulations like us in the UK, for example, regarding paying ransoms, regarding, you know, what level, uh, where do you take the negotiations to uh, in getting hostages back? Uh, I think we need to have some kind of a multilateral response and also at the same time uh, work closely with uh, partners um, who are in the regions, uh, who are allies of the United States. And um, we can depend on them in opening negotiations uh, and opening a path to bring Americans home. Uh, another thing I would like to add is the role of the private sector and trusted third parties. A lot of third parties have, um, you know, um, the mission, they share the mission with the government and the family to bring people home. Uh, unfortunately, from the experience that uh, we've been seeing, some third parties can complicate the situation more than helping it. So how can we put the third parties and the government and create some kind of a framework where they can work in tandem together uh, to, to, towards uh, the objective? Um, uh, I wanna add something about, you know, build on something that Cindy mentioned in the report is listening to the hostage families. Some of the biggest problems sometimes we notice that the government is doing a lot of work, but they don't know how to communicate that with the families, either because of bureaucracies or because of classifications or because of other issues that, you know, they always, the families always feel left out. The families know a lot about uh, the, the case of, of their loved ones. They, you know, a lot of times they develop the network, an extremely important network that's feeding them information also about what's going on, trying to help them. And, um, and the families proved again and again um, to be um, uh, a significant, uh, you know, power to the government and to others in order to bring justice and release hostages. I mean, the prosecution of the Beatles is a testament of what these families can achieve when they work together and um, work closely with the government. So in general, I mean, I don't want to say that slogan, it takes network to bring down network. 
but the families with third parties, with the government, with allies around the world, we need to figure out a strategy to work together to do this. Yes, um, uh, state actors now are more involved in illegally detaining Americans than non-state actors, but I agree 100% with what Brian said on this. This can change, and we need to develop a strategy to deal with the world as it is today, not as it was five years ago. Thank you, Ali. Um, and if the audience have questions, please put them in the uh, Slido box on the right of your video, and I'll uh, ask the panelists questions. But so let me ask um, all of you um, uh, to kind of assess the Biden administration's approach. I mean, um, you know, I think early on there was a, a certain amount of skepticism about the Biden administration that they weren't doing enough, they weren't really prioritizing this. But now, you know, Cindy mentioned Mark Frerichs being released. Of course, there was also Safi Rav and his brother, who's uh, um, a British citizen with an American green card. Uh, President Biden re recently met with uh, Brittany Griner's family and Paul Wellen's family. It seems that the intention level um, and also the success level is, is, is better than it might have been if we'd had this discussion early on in the administration. So anybody just jump in to react to that. You know, I'll, I'll take that. I think, look, uh, Peter, uh, we have a lot of great people uh, in this enterprise as we speak today. You know, you have, uh, you know, um, Chris O'Leary with the Fusion Cell. You have uh, uh, Roger Kirsten, who uh, President Biden continued to keep him in that post, and he was appointed by uh, President Trump. But also at the same time, one of the things that I think is benefiting uh, everyone is um, um, uh, Josh Geltzer being in his position in the NSC, who cares about these cases. He worked closely, um, as you know, uh, on the hostage issues uh, when he was out of government. And he has been uh, really kind of like, uh, you know, a person ironing all these issues behind the scenes. So uh, I think, again, um, when you talk to people under the former administration or under this administration, everybody's heart in the right position, uh, in, in the right place. Everybody wanted, um, to bring Americans home, but also at the same time, you have the personalities um, and you have um, kind of like uh, really good people today um, in the FBI at, at state and having Josh in the, in the White House um, playing that role that Chris Costa played before and also trying to work with uh, Robert O'Brien under the, other, uh, the, the former administration and putting these things together. So I, I think so far, uh, things are moving. Um, we have successes. Um, um, we've, you mentioned some of the people who have been released and there is more people who have been released. Um, and it's because of the great work that's happening in the interagency because of the leadership at the Fusion Cell, uh, the leadership of Roger Kirsten in his office and the support that they are getting from the NSC, especially from Josh Geltzer. Chris. Peter, if I could just jump on there yeah. and reiterate some of the some of the points that uh, Ollie just made, uh, all of those names just mentioned, Roger Carstens, Josh Geltzer, Chris O'Leary, we're all collectively communicating. Uh, people, all of us, are talking about specific cases. We're trying to apply appropriate pressure. We're trying to call, call it as we see it. And I think that also too is extremely healthy. The fact that an extended network, to put a finer point on what Ollie just said about the network to defeat a network, we're also a network that's communicating with each other because we've all learned hard lessons. And for those that want to throw stones at any respective uh, administration, it took us uh, in the Trump administration from January 2017, Inauguration Day, until October of 2017, until we brought our first hostage uh, home, and that was Caitlin Coleman. And it's a lot of work. It's difficult. And until you walk in those shoes, it is really hard for anyone to cast any aspersions because everyone's heart is in the right place. That said, I also agree with Ollie. Uh, to use a general McChrystalism, we have to continue to work to crush the bureaucracy and to break down the barriers and to ensure that consular affairs, for example, is in consonance with what 
you know, the president wants to some, uh, in, in some respects. Um, so those internecine battles that take place, the families uh, should not be participating in those fights whatsoever. They shouldn't even know that they happen. It should be completely seamless. We owe the families one thing, and that is hostage resolution. So the fight continues, and we can never rest on our laurels, as I've said. So I, I agree with everything Ali just articulated, and I just think that we continue to get better and more effective and more efficient, but we can never be satisfied because it's not good enough until we bring everyone home. If I could also just jump in too, um, I agree. There are some, there are fantastic individuals within the national security now that are working on these cases. And, you know, in the year before we had roughly around eight to 10 releases and we're having some releases this year, but, you know, I just don't want to move away from the fact that we still have 64 Americans that are held and on average for four years or longer, uh, where they're continuing to be held. And, you know, and the report's gonna highlight, you know, how to, how to look beyond just this current administration and also, uh, you know, in the future administrations. For instance, one of our recommendations is to create a new position within the National Security Council uh, to prioritize uh, hostage cases um, and continue productive relationships inside the administration with a strong focus on uh, regional counterparts at the State Department, National Security Council, and up to the national security level. Without those relationships, the ability to find common ground becomes more and more difficult to prioritize hostage cases. Most participants in the report believe that the key actors who focus, whose focus is required to obtain their loved ones release is the President, Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, and the National Security Advisor. So essentially the President's National Security Council. Um, you know, and for some participants, wrongful detainees, they believe that the challenge is actually on the regional side of the uh, National Security Council, and they struggle to manage how to prioritize their case on the regional side. And, you know, these regional directorates, and rightfully so, are focused on uh, current policy and the administration, uh, the policy that the administration has put forward. So adding a position like this is critical to build good relationships and to prioritize and focus on wrongful detention in hostage cases. Uh, there's nothing more important than you know, partner building in order to maintain focus, to ensure that uh, the regional directorates understand hostage and wrongful detainee issues, which is why we are emphasizing on creating this position because we don't wanna base decisions off of personalities that are currently within the White House we want to focus on how do we continue the legacy and proceed to, towards it into future administrations. I just wanted to point out to the audience that the report is now live on the on the Foley Foundation website. Um, if you want to look at the uh, the executive summary or the full report, Brian, uh, and your your reactions and also your reactions uh, as well, and the rest of the panel to the idea of putting. What I guess would be a senior director for detainee affairs on the National Security Council. Uh, you know, is that just another person or is that a good idea? Um, Peter, let me make a couple of, of I, I, I think, realistic, even if they sound uh, uh, cold blooded observations about this. <clears throat> it, it, it is possible to create new positions, it is possible to push these things, uh, this issue further. Uh, to, to further into the White House and, and up the ladder. Um, the reality at the same time is that the president, any president in, in, in dealing with hostage situations, on the one hand, is, is dealing with very difficult situations where uh, our ability, especially in dealing with, uh, in, in, in dealing with state detainers, uh, our ability, to affect their behavior is realistically limited. Uh, many of these nations that are engaged in this practice, uh, Iran, North Korea, and so on, have uh, poor human rights records of treating, they, they treat their own citizens uh, poorly. They operate outside of international norms. Uh, most of them do have uh, sanctions, diplomatic sanctions, economic sanctions, impose them on them anyway for, for uh, as a consequence of their behavior. 
So there isn't a lot of, of, of headroom for escalation uh, with, without, in some cases, um, the use of military force. Um, that's a reality. Um, now, to elevate that issue, in a sense, underscores that vexing reality, and, and that creates a, a, a real problem. The, the, the second observation is that there's no question that over the, as we've seen, in addition to the US government, in a sense, in, in getting its act together and, and, and creating platforms and procedures for dealing with this uh, issue more effectively than it has in the past, at the same time, the, the, the families of, of, of the hostages and, and individuals and groups representing of those families and those hostages have themselves in increased their organization in a sense. Now, the, uh, for the, the, the danger here is that, is, is that you don't want to see adv advocacy turning into an adversary relationship. And, and, and that's something we have to be mindful of. That is where um, the, the advocates of hostages will see the, uh, the US government as an adversary and uh, that it must, it, it must push uh, along. The, the final thing is, a uh, final observation is that there is in fact no agreement in this country on policies and strategies. There is still a debate, not just within the government, but a, a national debate uh, in, in a sense uh, among those who, who feel that the appropriate approach is to do whatever the nation possibly can, uh, whereas others who will argue that that number one uh, is, uh, is contrary to national interests, it's contrary to national dignity, um, and that it is inappropriate to do so. Moreover, it encourages repetition of this, of, of this activity. So the fact is, the reality is that a president is navigating between uh, a, a, a desire to bring hostages back. Every president wants to bring hostages back. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, is being pushed in one direction, has limited capacity in terms of making it happen. And whatever that president does will be, especially in our highly partisan environment, uh, he will be criticized and pummeled for doing it. Hmm. Yeah, sobering. Let me ask you, Cindy, uh, a question uh, about your findings. So. This, this average of four years is a pretty astonishing statistic. Is it, um, are states detaining, wrongfully detaining uh, Americans longer than terrorist groups, or is it sort of the same or roughly the same? What, what is, what accounts for this number? Right, without, you know, one of the things that we don't do is differentiate between the number of hostages and wrongful detainees with the current cases, just for an added level of protection. Uh, but to answer your question, the it's significantly, it's profoundly greater with wrongful detentions. One of the cases okay. is three years. Yeah, so states are holding Americans for prolonged periods, even more than terrorist groups. Correct. That's an important finding. Um, Ali, uh, I, we, we have five minutes left. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody, I've got, I've got some uh, questions from the audience. Um, maybe I'm just going to bunch them together uh, in the five minutes we have. Um, well, this is a great question. So on Mark Frerichs, you know, he was taken by the Akani network, which then became, became the government of Afghanistan. Um, how did this affect the strategy of getting him home? Um, and could the panel address a correlation between family advocacy, such as in the Griner case, and US yeah. government involvement? Um, yeah. Some complain, yeah, was well, there, yeah. So a question about family versus the government, what can families do individually versus the USG? And also the Frerichs case where, 
you know, this terrorist group became the government of Afghanistan. Uh, it fall back on a comment that uh, and Caitlin Coleman gave me permission to uh, to publicize a question that she asked me. And she said, when am I going to get my justice? And frankly, I said, I, I don't know, Caitlin, because I would like to see uh, Sirjan uh, Haqqani uh, go to uh, uh, U.S. court and face justice at some point in the future. And I think that we should never take our eye off the ball, whether he is a part of the Afghanistan government or not. Uh, his network violated the rights of Caitlin Coleman and her children. As such, we have to be relentless in our pursuit of justice long term. Uh, but it certainly complicates things when the Haqqani network becomes the when Haqqani becomes the Minister of Interior. And oh, by the way, uh, Haqqani is also giving succor to to uh, Zawahiri, who is number one on our terrorist list, um, you know, after bin Laden, or certainly he was elevated to that position and took bin Laden's place. So it does complicate uh, the, uh, the mosaic of trying to solve these cases. At the end of the day, the United States government, at some point, I can only presume, figured out what was very, very important to the Haqqani government. And uh, that was getting a drug lord uh, released from prison and in exchange, if I remember uh, the case. It's been a dizzying amount of, uh, of hostage reporting of late. Um, that's the first question. And the second question is, I think if I understood the context, it's about hostages be, or hostage families being public, putting pressure on the administration and trying to seek, um, you know, find that balance, I suspect, um, on being uh, careful not to uh, cause any harm for negotiations that are ongoing. At the same time, um, all I can do or, or all I did when I was in the government is strongly encourage that families engage with the National Security Council and the FBI's hostage fusion cell uh, to ensure that they're, they're not being disruptive of some kind of effort that is ongoing. And that goes back to Ali's point. The U.S. government also has to be forthcoming with the with the efforts that are ongoing. So we do not the unintended consequences are not causing harm to hostages that are being detained by terrorists or foreign governments uh, like like the Taliban government. So it is a balance. But I strongly encourage that families continue to engage with the U.S. government. But at the end of the day, they have to do what they think is right. And uh, um, and in some cases, that's going to be to be outspoken about the uh, situation that their family members are in. I know Ali has a hard out in one minute. So, Ali, let's, we'll go to you for your final thought. I uh, fully agree with uh, what Chris mentioned on both cases. And uh, I think um, when it comes to Haqqani being the Minister of Interior of uh, the Taliban government, um, I think uh, lots of things the devil, the devil is in the details in any of these negotiations. And Haqqani wanted to be at the front and center of the negotiations with Mark Farrick. Uh, but, um, you know, towards the end, he wasn't as much uh, involved in the final uh, as much as the uh, Taliban government. And that makes a lot of sense. And I think the U.S. government was able to play that thin line between Haqqani uh, and his network uh, holding uh, Mark in between negotiating the deal with the entity of the government that they have been talking to uh, since uh, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and the Biden administration in Afghanistan. So I think I think that balance um, has been achieved, and uh, I think the devil is in the details towards the end. Um, as for the second question, I have nothing else to add to what my uh, brilliant friend Chris mentioned about the families and the government. Okay, in order to stay on time, um, I'm going to thank Cindy for the report and her participation, Chris Costa, Ali Sufan and Brian Jenkins uh, for their uh, very um, in interesting and informed commentary on the report. And I'm going to turn it over to Amna Nawaz, who's the chief correspondent of PBS NewsHour who's going to moderate uh, the next panel. Uh, there are still some questions from the audience that haven't been answered, and I presume Amna will, will get to those as, as, as uh, she uh, now takes over. Thank you. 
I will indeed do my best, thank you, Peter, Peter. Thank you so much for that. Thank you to New America as well for hosting this forum and to Diane Foley and the Foley Foundation. I'm Amna Navaz from the PBS NewsHour, and I'm honored to be leading this conversation. Um, this one will focus on the challenges and the urgency of recovering U.S. hostages and wrongful detainees. And if you allow me now, I'll just introduce our panel as they all come online. Joining us now is Diane Foley, the president and founder of the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation, the mother, of course, of Jim Foley, who was kidnapped and murdered by the Islamic State in 2014. Also with us on the panel is Jared Genzer, managing director of Perseus Strategies. Jared, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Also with us is Nizar Zaka. He's president of Hostage Aid Worldwide and also himself a former wrongful detainee in Iran. And Neda Shargi is also with us. Neda is the sister of Emad Shargi, who is a U.S. citizen wrongfully detained in Iran since 2018. Neda, good to see you. Thank you for having me. And I believe we see Diane with us now as well. Diane, we can see you and let's make sure we can hear you as well. You're still muted. Yes. There we go. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Amna. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you so much for having me. And Diane, I will I will start with you here. Uh, we just heard the details of the latest report, of course, from Cindy. But let's let's set the foundation from the family's perspective. And since the 2015 hostage policy reforms, the landscape has really changed globally and the US response has had to change as well. So just give us kind of a broad sense. How has the entire hostage enterprise changed in that time? How well has it adapted to the current hostage and wrongful detainee landscape? What do you think? Well, at least we have a structure. When um, Jim was taken in 2012, there was no hostage enterprise. So we currently have an interagency fu uh, fusion cell. We have a brilliant office at the State Department and certainly some advocates at the national security level. So we're very grateful for all that progress. Our concerns are that it's difficult, more and more difficult to bring people home because of this increased um, detention, wrongful detention by state actors, by countries. Used to be primarily Iran and China who took our people, but these days we have 19 countries in the last 10 years who have in fact found this tactic um, something they want to pursue and are taking our innocent U.S. nationals nationwide. So we're very concerned. Those are our concerns. We just want to, as Ali Soupant and Chris um, said, we must continually adapt and update our strategies because it appears that it's becoming an increasing national security risk for U.S. nationals. And my apologies, I just want to introduce one more panelist. Mickey, I weren't sure, I wasn't sure you'd be able to join us or not. I'm so glad you are. This is Mickey Bergman, Vice President and Executive Director of the Richardson Center. Thank you for being with us. And I'll put the next question to you. We heard those numbers from the latest report. Uh, this year's Bringing Americans Home says there's a, there been a significant increase, about 580% in the total number of US nationals wrongfully held from 2001 to 2011, when you hear that number, it is striking. I mean, what should people who are learning about this for the first time, what should they understand about those numbers? Well, thank you. And I apologize for the background here. I just wanted to make sure I, I, I get in time for this. Um, I, I think the numbers are staggering. I, I think we need to understand that there's, uh, that there's nuance in it. Uh, there are several countries that have become serial offenders. Um, um, uh, namely, uh, you look at Venezuela, Russia, China, Iran. Uh, if you take the numbers from these countries cumulatively out, we're actually going down to the more or less regular levels, which is still unfortunate and too big. Um, uh, but we certainly have a very specific problem uh, here. And it is, uh, I think, was even articulated by the President of the United States, it is a national security crisis. And everybody listening to this need to understand that it can hit it, it can hit everybody, um, and it's it's we we tend to think about it as and say oh yeah those people they travel they take risks, or they do risky things. When you actually look at the facts, there are people who just travel to safe countries, did their thing, and got trapped. 
and and before they know it, the families are, find themselves in an unmanageable situation. Um, so that's number one to understand that this can hit anybody. It's not just people who are taking risks or anything that has to do with their fault. The second uh, issue, and that's important, is I think we need to recognize that one of the consequences of us not dealing with it as a national security for the time it's been going up is, is, the, is re resulting in more and more people being taken. I think we need to address it seriously from all levels, from the US government, from civil society, from organizations, from families, to understand this has to be addressed seriously. In, in, and when I say that, there might be measures that are not going to be comfortable, but we need to bring all of those who have been taken, we need to bring them back. And then we need to take as a country, as a government, take the measures to deter and to make sure that that behavior changes. Nazar, I see you nodding your head as Mickey is talking. Do you agree this is a national security issue that needs to be treated as such? Definitely, that's uh, Mike, what you're saying is perfectly correct. We need to take it seriously and it's not being taken seriously. And this, uh, we have different channels and I don't think we are ready. For, uh, the government is doing what, what it should to get the hostages back. What else do you believe the government should be doing? I mean, there, there is, I wanted to ask you about this issue about being specifically designated as a wrongful detainee. It's a very specific designation. It's not always easy for families to get for their loved ones. What do people need to understand about that? I, I don't think currently the government is trying, in order to be to be designated as wrongful deta detainee, it's a long process. It's, it's not clear. Nobody will understand how it works. You just have to send a letter to the, to the secretary and then it goes and no reply, no response. It's, it's really everything they're doing is so vague and there is not one stop shop where some where a family can go and get a proper answer and information. It's everybody who will drop it on the other entity is that they don't have the, the power or like they're not uh, like uh, entitled to do that or whatever. So this is what we're facing. Well, I believe I believe the families are suffering, returning like the Spiha today. We believe that it is becoming an, an entity just to, to keep the, like to keep everybody calm and not to speak up and not to speak about what's going on with, with their loved ones. And, and I, I don't see any serious matter, even for returnees, like let me take a small example, what the Follies Foundation did. The Follies interviewed us over the past few years, more than the State Department or the FBI interviewed us about what happened to us to, to learn from what happened and to, to, take, to, to know what's going on when we are on the inside or to take care of our families. Like the most important thing for the current hostages or unlawful det detainees is how, uh, what, what is happening to their families, how, how they are being treated in their absence. And there is nothing whatsoever about, about taking care of the families of the, of the detainees, nor about giving the families any information. So for, from both sides, there is, a, there is a big problem. Otherwise, to keep the families quiet, to, to go to, to 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 call to call Siamak as a family of, of to call back in, uh, Babak Namazi every day and tell him that everything is fine. Whenever you talk to an official, he will tell you, yes, we are in touch with Babak and Babak is calm. Yes, he's calm, but Siamak has been for seven years in prison. So so there is something wrong. There is no real action. And exactly uh, like Mickey say, it's it should it should we should put an end. We we should do whatever it takes to get our hostages back, to do a swap, to pay, to do whatever like the, like they did in the UK. And then we have to open a new page where this we put an end completely and have a very strict uh, guidelines about what happened to anybody who take a U.S. citizen or a, 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 a LPR uh, uh, hostage or, uh, or unlawful detention. I, I think this is about time to do it. I, I have to say I'm really struck by what you share that you had more contact and more interviews with folks from the Foley Foundation after being released than you ever did with the U.S. government. I think that in and of itself is striking. And Jared, I'll turn to you to get a better sense of that US government response now over time. I mean, we've laid out how the landscape has shifted. You have more state actors. You've seen the increase in, in wrongful detainees. As Diane mentioned, there is now is an interagency process, but has the US response shifted to meet what we're seeing in, in the hostage and wrongful detainee landscape? 
So, I mean, I think as was said by the last panel, um, you know, the progress has been uh, incremental, not exponential, and we need a response commensurate with the severity of the problem, um, which has to be a much greater sense of urgency. I really drive home the point on the designations under the Levinson Act for a person to be found to be unlawfully or wrongfully detained. There are 11 criteria in the act that are supposed to be evaluated. And right now, for example, I've got a case in Cambodia of Thierry Sang. Uh, who's a dual national uh, in prison there. And in, in this particular case, we've had the U.S. government, the State Department itself, publicly call for her release and three senior U.S. government officials, two at the State Department and Samantha Power at USAID. And yet three months later, she hasn't been designated as unlawfully or wrongfully detained, um, which is obviously rather bizarre. Um, I, I also think that you know we don't have to wait to get the current decks cleared, in my view, to, to try to do something to improve our, our overall efforts. Um, I published an op-ed in July uh, this past uh, summer uh, in the Wall Street Journal proposing that the that President Biden lead a new multilateral effort um, to uh, create potentially draconian consequences um, you know, for, uh, for countries that engage in hostage taking of individual hostages or wrongful detainees for a pattern and practice of those behaviors. Um, you know, we, we've been engaging in this whole hostage enterprise really the same way going back to 79 and the Iran uh, embassy takeover. One case, one uh, country, one hostage at a time, right? You know, and this is not obviously working uh, for us. And we need a multilateral approach. And if you can get 50 or 60 countries together onto a single multilateral agreement saying these are actions we will take, consider taking, you know, individually, uh, you know, bilaterally and multilaterally uh, in order to uh, respond to. Uh, individual countries hostage taking, you can dramatically incur, uh, you, you increase the um, the cost to countries of taking hostages. And that's the only way you change the hostage taking practice. You know, um, the incentives are still there as we were, have, we've all been discussing. Um, and it's very rewarding. The only way you change the calculus is making it very damaging, not very rewarding. Uh, and so I've, I've even put forward and happy to share with anyone uh, who wants to reach out to me after this, um, you know, a draft of what a multilateral agreement might actually look like that identifies about 25 different specific consequences that countries could potentially impose in response to individual cases and patterns of practices of hostage taking. So Ned, that we've talked a lot about the U.S. government response, so let's talk about families and their role in all of this. You've recently taken on uh, a much more active role in the Bring Our Families Home campaign. It's a family-led campaign. It's asking the U.S. government to understand the urgency of bringing loved ones home. Tell us about the campaign, how it came about, and why you believe its messaging in particular is so critical right now. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm the only um, family member on of a current hostage, and um, it's it's difficult to be on a panel when you have a loved one currently detained abroad, but I have to say it's incredibly important. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the campaign started because I think families in general feel that um, what our government does and what our experts do, experts in this field, is that they often couple the issue of bringing Americans home with deterrence. And the purpose of this campaign really is to de decouple those two things, um, to add a sense of urgency, and of course, to appeal to our president to meet with us. Now, this issue of decoupling, you know, in medicine, you de decouple um, diagnosis and treatment from prevention. Um, when we talk about hostages, we seem to lump it all together. And one of the biggest obstacles to families in getting their loved ones home is this prevention piece. And what what you know, I think families in the campaign do, um, and also you know, individually in our advocacy, is to try and encourage. Um, experts in this field and our government to not do that. Um, they're two separate things and need to be handled differently. So for example, um, you know, one of the things that we urge um, our government to do and to bring our families home is to bring our loved ones home as soon as possible because data shows that if you don't bring them home quickly, they end up staying longer. Um, and that's why we have folks who are staying, you know, my brother has been there for four and a half years, the Namazis have been there almost for seven years. So the urgency is to get them home quickly. If you don't get them home quickly, we have seen that several things happen that actually impede the efforts. One is 
these individuals become more entrenched in, in the hands of their captors. Two coincidental world events happen that make it difficult to bring our, our loved ones home. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that we see is that, you know, the longer it takes to bring our loved ones home, the more domestic politics sort of interfere with, with our, our national responsibility to bring home our loved ones. So the campaign is really trying to reshift the conversation um, on wrongful detainees to say, look, bring them home first. If you don't bring them home, you know, it's actually more damaging in many ways, not, not only for the wrongful detainees, but also for, for our own internal politics and the divisiveness and the, uh, the partisanship that sometimes gets involved in, in, in recovery of our detainees. Mickey, when you hear Neda sharing this, can can these things be decoupled? I mean, when you're talking about domestic pressures, you have more countries now involved in, in U.S. hostage and wrongful detainee taking. How does it not get wrapped up in larger government conversations? Uh, well, I think listening to Neda, I, I, I think she's, she's a, a million percent right. Uh, those things, not only that they can be decoupled, decoupled, it's critical that they do get decoupled. Um, I'll make an analogy. When, when there's a domestic uh, um, uh, kidnapping in the United States for ransom, criminal, okay? FBI steps in. The first thing they do, first priority, is to help the family figure out a way to get the victim back home. If it means to pay ransom, they arrange for it. They help the family arrange for it safely to maximize the chances of the person coming back home safely. Why? Because 90% of the time, if that's the approach that is taken, the person comes back, the victim comes back home. Now, once the victim is home, the FBI doesn't pack their stuff and go away. No, they go and they prosecute and they find the people responsible for it and bring them to justice. But again, first, the victim comes home. Then you deal with the, with the deterrence and the punishment uh, for this. So I think it's not only that it's, it's possible, it has to be decoupled. I think that holding um, uh, 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 deals to bring back prisoners, our prisoners, our hostages back in the name of future deterrence is as if we are holding them hostage to our own policies. And that is morally bankrupt. We cannot do that. Um, I, I want to just add one more thing. It is not a coincidence that the countries that are serial offenders, and we mentioned them here, are the same countries that were already maximized on sanctions, with sanctions on them. Which means if you already maximized on sanctions, adding more sanctions is not going to be effective. And, and I know that sanctions have become, unfortunately, the tool of diplomacy over the last decade. Uh, they are a tool, they're not the tool, and I believe that some people who have taken Americans and have wronged Americans, and Diane has led, uh, has led uh, um, uh, prosecutions on this, need to be prosecuted in the United States. They need to be indicted in the United States. Even if they don't recognize our jurisdiction, you can put extradition uh, um, notice on them, not sanctions on a judge. The judge doesn't do business with the United States, it's not going to impact their lives. But if a judge can't go to a family vacation anymore because of a fear of being extradited, because there's been an indictment in the US, I know it sounds radical, but again, we are in really, really serious crisis here and we need to, to make deterrence. And again, has to be absolutely independent of the effort to bring back those who are already being taken. Diane, what do you make of, of what Mickey's saying here, especially uh, in terms of prioritizing this for the US government? Well, I totally agree with everyone. Um, this is a very urgent nonpartisan issue. And that is why the Foley Foundation is really calling for a comprehensive all of government review. Why is it getting more and more difficult to bring our people home? Why are state actors steadily seeing the taking of our citizens as an important hostage tactic, if you will? We must deter it, yes, but before we do that, we need to look at why this is happening and bring our people home. We have a moral um, uh, obligation to have the backs of our brave citizens um, who are out in the world doing their work or visiting family. Um, so 
I, we are really calling for, um, because this is a national security crisis, we must treat it as such and do a comprehensive review of why this is alarmingly increasing and people are being held much, much too long. It is, it is something we must address as a nation. Jared, I see you nodding too. I mean, I, I want this idea of it being seen as a national security crisis. I can't tell you how many families who have loved ones detained overseas have told me they feel like it's not a priority. Do you think it is, there's a turning point, is there a tipping point where it is seen as a national security issue to bring Americans home? Yeah, I mean, I, well, we're, we're clearly not there. Um, and, you know, we obviously see cases come and go, um, you know, on, on the global stage, you know, Brittany Griner's case has obviously attracted a lot of attention recently. And while I would definitely say that she's arbitrarily detained as a matter of international law, you know, her case uh, isn't the most ideal case to be putting forward to talk about these issues um, because, you know, she may have done something wrong, uh, even if she's arbitrarily detained because of the abject lack of due process and, and uh, you know, disparate targeting, sentencing, et cetera. Um, you know, the reality is that uh, that these kinds of cases come and go, but the attention of the U.S. government, uh, especially from the White House, does not remain sustained. There are also distinctions that are made that to me are very arbitrary between, you know, who is considered a hostage versus unlawfully or wrongfully detained. If you're designated as a hostage, Hostage, you have the you know the hostage fusion cell at the White House that will help you. The FBI will help you, et cetera. Um, but you know, I, I have had many conversations with people in the White House and the State Department over the years, especially in the legal advisor's office. And you know, many of the detainees that we would call unlawfully or wrongfully detained are in fact hostages. You know, Iran is holding all of these uh, uh, these Americans, including my pro bono clients, Stephen Mack and Bhaskar Namazi. Um, as hostages to trade for something of value. It meets the definition of hostage taking under U.S. and international law, and yet, you know, we don't call them hostages, um, uh, at least as a matter of, uh, matter of law in the United States. Um, so, you know, I think that we do need to attract much more attention on this. I think that the work that's being done, you know, to... Uh, you know, to shine the, the images of hostages on buildings, uh, the, the beautiful mural in DC. You know, these are all you know uh, awareness raising uh, efforts. Um, but uh, I think we do uh, very much agree with virtually everything in the report. Uh, everything I've read so far of the report from the Foley Foundation, which has done a brilliant job looking at these issues. Um, and one of their recommendations is to have somebody senior at the White House, as we were discussing. And I think that that's very, very important um, you know, to have a person there at the White House. While Roger Karsten's in the SPIHA office, the special envoy's office do a great job from where they sit, you know, working for the secretary at the State Department. The bottom line is, uh, and I saw the statistics of people interviewed by the Foley Foundation, 85% of the families believe that nothing short of White House engagement will get their loved ones out. It may not be an accurate assessment, um, but it's probably an accurate assessment in most cases or in many cases uh, uh, that we're talking about here. And we need that high level engagement, not just on a one time basis on a high profile case, um, but you know, consistently and over time. The reality is most Americans when they travel abroad have no idea um, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that they could get themselves into trouble and be grabbed in, in really any country that is, uh, you know, not a democracy, or you can even just be grabbed because you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, you know, the, you know, the most amazing thing to me when I talk to people who were detained, uh, you know, hostages and were grabbed is that, you know, they, their thought was, well, gosh, if I am, for example, returning to Iran to see my family, I figure, you know, how could I get into trouble if I do nothing wrong, right? And of course, that uh, you don't have to do something wrong to be taken hostage uh, anywhere in the world. Neda, tell us what you can about your experience. As you mentioned, you are uniquely positioned on this panel with your brother still held in Iran. Help us understand what it is like for you right now, what support you are receiving, and what support you need. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to, uh, you know, uh, commend the Foley Foundation for um, being here for us and for putting out these research reports that are actually data-driven and not um, based on um, anecdotal sort of myth. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think Diane mentioned is she would like the government to sort of try to understand why this is happening more and more and more. And one of the things that we say as part of the Bring Our Families Home campaign is, there are many reasons why Americans are being taken, but 
one of the reasons that they're not being taken is because we are bringing other Americans home. We are we are securing the freedom of our Americans. And that is something that's also very important to understand. There is a myth that makes it very challenging for families like mine as we advocate for our loved ones. And that myth is that if you bring home um, an American who's wrongfully detained, you are going to incentivize and encourage future hostage taking. I can't tell you how problematic that is. It's not based on data. It's not based on evidence. And it's it's crushing as a family um, to be told that over and over and over again. So it's really important for us to have the data that we have in this new report. I know Brian Jenkins um, has um, you know, very scientifically done data that they can show that this is, there is no correlation between those. So I think as, as a family member, it's the lack of urgency, mm -hmm. the myths that are currently circulating among mm -hmm. the very people that are really supposed to be helping us get our loved ones home. Nazar, what about you? From your experience, can you talk a little bit about the support when you returned home, what you were able to receive, um, what you think improvements that need to be made? Yeah, for me, for example, like my case, and uh, I believe we have, I haven't received any support. The only support, uh, zero support from the government. And uh, in fact, not even a medical support. I had to. I had to pay. When you come back, you have no credit card. You have nothing in in place. And I had to pay. My family had to cover everything. Uh, uh, and the most important, even when you are taken hostage, and it's obvious case of hostage taking, like uh, like mine, for example. But everybody has exactly like the same cases where you are invited, where you go to the country and you're taken by a terrorist group, with, which is the IRGC, and and for for only reason for uh, considered like collaborating with the U.S. government. And you have to pay for your lawyer. You have to make a campaign to get uh, to, to, to your family, have to pay every single penny they have in order to cover for, uh, to make awareness, to create awareness, to, to travel to DC, to do all these things and nothing from the government. Until today, we don't see, we don't see the system is changing. They don't appoint you a lawyer. They don't do anything. They, I don't. I don't understand how it's it's gonna move unless we have a complete change. I know all the regulation and all the act are very important because they're changing. Uh, they, they're giving more attention to hostage taking, but but there is nothing straightforward. There is nothing really clear, systematic that we know. This is if this happens, this is the reactions that will happen. And more importantly, there is no, uh, uh, taking a hostage, a US citizen hostage is an act of war. Until today, we are, we, we are uh, it's an act of war against the US. Until today, we're not considering it this way. We're to consider every single way except an act of war. It's, so it's like even they're using it for diplomacy and they maybe open a diplomatic channel. And this, I, I, don't, I really we cannot understand as former hostages uh, at our organization, we have many former hostages. And when we discuss, we don't understand why this is happening. What's the reason uh, of uh, the government doing it this way? Uh, and this will keep on going. So this is what I have to say. Well, Diane, I don't think most people know that about the burden borne by families. I mean, how, how does that change? It's so true. To be honest, the reason the Foley Foundation started was because I wanted no other American family to go through the horror of what we did. So to be honest, this just breaks my heart um, as I've gotten to know Netta and Nizar, Mickey and Jared, all of these folks who know families and know the horror of being held hostage when you're totally innocent and only held because you have a US passport. So I, I challenge our president Biden and his administration to prioritize this issue. We, we, have a, we need to have the moral courage to have the backs of our people. It comes down to that. And if we don't, uh, we're not gonna make any progress on this issue. So I, there are many issues that need addressing. The Levinson Act, um, uh, Hostage Taking and Accountability Act was awesome, but it's not funded. Wrongful detainees' families have no funds to help 
their loved ones? Should they have the success of coming home or should they be held hostage year after year? There's no funding to help detainees in prison who need that. There's no help, as Mizar said, when they come home. There's no funding to help returned hostages. So we have many holes as a government that we must prioritize and fix. And again, that's why I challenge the current administration and all Americans from right or left to prioritize the return of our people by taking a look at this issue. Why is this happening? Why are more people being taken? Why are they not coming home in a um, reasonable manner? And then once that happens, yes, we need deterrence, but it, they, are, they must be separate because we must bring our people home. Well, we've Appreciate had a few that. questions come in now and I hope you don't mind if I put those to the panel. If you feel compelled to answer, just let me know and, and jump in and we'll go through a few of these before I turn back to Diane for the last word here, if you don't mind. But one that's just come in um, is about the extent uh, family efforts are networked. Um, someone has submitted this question, I'll read it here. It says, to what extent are family efforts networked with similar efforts in other countries from families of non-Americans held by various governments or groups? Is there any kind of coordination that anyone knows about? I, uh, neither, Please. Neither can, oh, uh, I, yeah, in fact, what we have, we, uh, the hostages, of families of hostages all around the world now, they're, con they're coordinating, we're working together. And we have from, uh, like, from France, Germany, Sweden, UK, they all connect, uh, coordinate together and try to 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 address it, like uh, to address the issues. But uh, but current, but because the governments are not unified in their approach toward hostage taking, each country at, end up doing their advocacy on their own. And this is something like, but what what we do somehow, we try whenever we find out that uh, something is happening in Europe or in Belgium, there is a swap or something. We try to also to inform that uh, to uh, other in other countries so they can coordinate this or the Levinson or the uh, or uh, like we, we we tell them about what happened with Levinson Act and all the things so they coordinate all together. Neda, did you want to say something to that? Right. I mean, I think Nazar is right. I mean, in terms of our campaign, the Bring Our Families Home campaign, you know, we don't have a coordination with any of the other hostage families living abroad. We do keep in touch with them via Instagram and Twitter and try to support one another. Um, but because, you know, every government is different and the strategies that we have to use here to get the attention of, of you know, the White House and, the, uh, and others are very different than what other countries do. Um, require. There's no coordinated um, effort. I do have to say one thing that I've noticed is that, you know, as, as you know, we, we get the good news that we have detainees being released. One of the things I notice is that when a detainee is released and they're given a chance to recover and they join sort of at the organization that Nizar, for example, runs, um, the, 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 the thinking switches from let's get our loved ones home and immediately goes into deterrence. And oftentimes that is at odds with what we are trying to accomplish as, as wrongful detainees. So um, that's something that, you know, Nazar, you and I should, we should talk about in the way to, to, to how to manage that. But that's unfortunately when, when hostages come home, we want to get their support to advocate the government to do whatever is necessary to get our loved ones home. But we, what we find is that when hostages come home, after a while, they, they switched on to the deterrence. And often mm -hmm. that sort of um, impedes our efforts to get our loved ones home. Well, here's a related question that, Jared, I'd love to get your and, and Mickey's take on. Um, someone's asking, could the panel address the correlation between family advocacy, and they cite the example of Brittany Griner, and U.S. government involvement? To some, they write, only families who complain get attention. I would add to that that maybe even families who give media interviews and who raise a fuss and, you know, maybe even go against government advice to go public with their cases. Uh, that they tend to get more attention. What do you think of that? 
Yeah, I mean, well, I think there's obviously something to it. I think there's a high correlation, uh, although it's not a perfect correlation, between families that speak out and the kind of attention that they can get. Brittany Griner's family obviously can get a unique level of attention that really few others I've ever really seen um, so quickly to get uh, attention of the president and vice president of the United States. Um, you know, making a decision to go public is always a very difficult decision, and having served as pro bono counsel to countless um, wrongfully imprisoned Americans, um, you know, it's something you have to think through very carefully. At the end of the day, um, you know, you need the help of the U.S. government um, uh, to help get your loved one out. And so a decision to come out, for example, and criticize uh, the U.S. government is a very tough one, uh, you know, to make. Um, undoubtedly, though, there are times when coming out publicly, if commitments have been broken um, or uh, if you, you don't see the sense of urgency that's necessary, uh, is really, really important. You know, one of the things that families can do that's quite effective prior to necessarily coming out against the U.S. government or, um, or even coming out publicly um, about a case in, at all is, of course, to get support from Capitol Hill and to get bipartisan support from the Hill to be reaching out to, uh, to the State Department and pressing them on various issues of, of concern to the particular family. Um, but I think it is very important. To, to use the media, um, you know, uh, you know, if you can't try to get a person out uh, through private diplomacy in the first instance. Mickey, what would you say? Yeah, I, I think there's um, every family in, in a situation like that gets gets uh, pushed in many many directions, and it's really really hard for them. They they're making they need to make decisions that will impact their loved ones uh, based on false, uh, partial, and or no information at all. Um, and conflicting information for sure. Uh, and there is a, 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 a knee-jerk knee reaction by the government to say, oh, don't go public. Um, when we work with families, and currently I'm working, typically we would work on six families uh, um, simultaneously. Uh, we're now working on 22 families at the same time at the Richardson Center. And the Richardson Center is, is the governor, myself, and two other short-term consultants. Uh, we're not big. Um, uh, about half of these cases are have gone public, half of them have not. Uh, when a family needs to consider going public, uh, they need to realize that nothing that they will say will convince the captor to release their loved one. The captor is not the object the object of, of going public. As Jared actually uh, said correctly, um, uh, the objective of going public is to deploy pressure uh, on our own government to have urgency and take action. And so you need to assess as a family whether you go public or not, first considering where you believe our government is at bringing your loved one uh, back home. Um, I think uh, Brittany Griner, because of her uh, status, has been able to garner a lot of attention. I have to give a lot of credit to Sherelle Griner and to Brittany's team that they are using this not only for the sake of Brittany Griner, they have elevated this issue for all the families. They're being very, very supportive. Um, and inclusive in this, um, and I, I and I hope uh, uh, that um, uh, when Brittany comes home, that that attention doesn't go away, but it actually stays there. Um, uh, uh, to the point uh, Neda made before uh, uh, about prisoners coming back and then switching into 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 a deterrence focus, it's true. It makes sense. You can understand why they would do it, um, uh, um, uh, and, and Neda is absolutely right. We need them to stay focused also on bringing back the people that were just in the position that they were. I think Trevor Reed, after coming back, has been a great example of how to do that. Um, and he's been everywhere saying like, and this is my last point with this, it doesn't matter how bad, bad in quotations, the deal look like in terms of the people you have to give up or whatever concessions you make in order to bring back Americans. Uh, we have to dispel the myth that it makes us look weak or that it makes us weak. It doesn't. It actually makes us stronger. Even if the deal is really, really bad on justice perspective, it makes us stronger because we do everything we can to bring our people back home. And that we, we have to change that concept uh, in order to, to get that done. Neda, I would love to get your take on this because you are living this right now, when to speak, when not to speak, weighing all of these incredibly difficult decisions. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, it's true. I think uh, we have to be very patient with families. They have to go through their own, you know, um, you know, their own comfort level of when they're quiet, when they're not, when they come out, and we just have to support them. 
Um, and, you know, I do also want to say, you know, that there, there's a lot mentioned about you know, Brittany Griner and the fact that she's getting a lot of attention because of her celebrity status. But I, like Mickey, you know, being in the Bring Our Families Home campaign, um, have to tell you these projections that we just did in New York City, where we projected the images of 19 of our Americans on buildings around, you know, Manhattan, that was done in partnership with BG's, with Britney's team. That's something that we probably couldn't have, have managed to do alone. And so I think families are realizing, whether you're famous, whether you're not, that at the end of the day, we are Americans and we come together to try to get attention and to support one another. And, you know, we put Britney on our mural in Washington, DC. And, you know, we had lots of folks from, from Congress come and, and, and look at it and talk to us. And we got a lot of press about it. So um, I do feel a little bit defensive about, uh, you know, all, all the sort of comments that um, Britney's, Britney's getting about getting too much attention. She, she has, through her team and through our, our campaign really, you know, put a spotlight on this issue for all of us. And we're grateful. We have just a few minutes left and I do wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So if you don't mind, I will turn it over to Diane to give us a final word here. There's been a lot covered. There's a lot for people to go through in the latest report um, and clearly a lot of work to be done. So Diane, I, I turn it over to you just to leave us with final thoughts on what you hope people take away from this report, from these conversations. Well, I hope people um, recognize the fact that we are grateful for the steps that have um, been taken. However, it is so poignant in our government that uh, families who are going through the horror of this ordeal have to organize their own campaign and go to the UN, which they did in New York City, try to beg for funds to put the pictures of their loved ones on buildings to get the attention of this administration, to get the attention of our people. This is uh, an American issue. We need to have the moral resolve and commitment to in fact bring our people home. And this is something we need champions in Congress. There's no question about that. We need um, our congress congressmen and women and senators to become more and more aware of what is going on and the alarming increase in incidents. And we do also need my bilateral, uh, multilateral efforts such as hostage aid worldwide. And as Jared said, through the UN of countries coming together. When Jim was taken in 2012, he was taken with 18 other US allies. But instead of us coming together to figure out a way to bring them home, every country did it their own way. So all the Americans, all the British were murdered. That was the way it was resolved. That doesn't have to be. I think it's time for our country to take the leadership on this issue and to make sure that we show the strength and our moral resolve to bring our people home. So that's my hope for this panel. Thank you, um, Amna and all of you. So appreciate your time. Thank you, Diane. Thank you to Neda Shargi, to Nizar Zaka, Mickey Bergman, and Jared Genzer. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Just a reminder, the 2022 Bringing Americans Home report is now on the website. Thank you again for joining us, in particular to Diane Foley and the Foley Foundation. Thank you.